Welcome, everyone. Uh, this evening, I have the honor of introducing to you Ambassador Luis C. DeVaca. Luis C. DeVaca is Ambassador at Large to monitor and combat trafficking in persons. He has worked under three presidential administrations to combat human trafficking and modern day forms of slavery. He was appointed by President Obama in 2009 to direct the Office to Monitor and Combat Trafficking in Persons at the Department of State. He served formally as counsel to the House Committee on the Judiciary, where his portfolio included national security, intelligence, immigration, and civil rights. Ambassador Sidavaka is a graduate of Iowa State University, and received his law degree from Michigan Law School. We welcome here, him here again this evening as part of the World Affairs series. On behalf of ISU and the Network Against Human Trafficking, Ambassador, we wish to extend a special thanks to you for your support of our efforts to end human trafficking in Iowa. On October 26, 2011, you supported Iowa's first statewide conference on human trafficking, the Iowa Conference on Human Trafficking. The conference was held here in this room and attended by over 150 persons representing law enforcement, social service, legal, educational, public health, nonprofit, and government entities, all of which are working to end human trafficking in our state. You're taking the time to send us a personal video recorded message to the conference participants on the importance of our efforts continues to inspire us and your presence here today gives us courage to recognize the face of human trafficking, even in the communities where we live, we work, and we raise our families. Thank you for devoting your heart, your talents, your time, your life, to ending human slavery around the world and here in Iowa. Thank you very much for joining us, bringing us all together to win this battle. My name is George Belitzos. I'm on the board of directors of the Network Against Human Trafficking. I'm also the chief executive officer of Youth and Shelter Services, which is based here in Ames. We provide, among other uh, programs, uh, Iowa's largest runaway and homeless youth service. In Des Moines, we're known as Iowa Homeless Youth Centers. I'm here tonight to present an award that we give out once a year, and I'm presenting this award to the ambassador on behalf of the youth who are very vulnerable to human trafficking in Iowa, and I'm joined by one of the youth in our program. Uh, her name is Brittany, who is going to help me present this award. Brittany is a survivor of human trafficking. Uh, she uh, is from Story County, as the ambassador is himself, bringing it right home to where we are. So I'll have Brittany uh, introduce herself and tell you about her story, and then we will present the award. Brittany. Hi, my name is Brittany, and I'm a survivor of human trafficking, and I want to briefly tell you a little bit about my story. At the age of 15, I was a runaway with another girl and ended up in Cedar Rapids with her, in her home uh, where there were drugs and abuse, and later I was approached in Hy-Vee by an older man who asked me if I wanted a modeling job, and I agreed to it, and later I was transported to Chicago where I was held in a hotel against my will and I was abused for a month and a half before I was rescued by an undercover police officer. And today I am adopted by my foster parents and I have a permanent home. Unfortunately, it was too dangerous for me to go back to Chicago to testify 
so I wasn't able to. And although I wasn't able to do that, I am healing enough to share my story with people and you guys to educate you on how vulnerable kids are to human trafficking. And we'd like to thank the ambassador for all that he is doing to fight against human trafficking. And I would like to take a moment to uh, recognize uh, Brittany's foster adoptive parents from Story City, Ruth and Bill Buckle, Stan. They have... Helping Brittany turn her scars into stars. And now she is taking steps to share with others to educate us that this is human trafficking is right here at home. Uh, of the cases, about 125 cases that are documented of human trafficking over the last four to five years here in Iowa. Um, most of those, tra uh, of those cases are runaway and homeless youth, um, teenage girls primarily, who were moved into prostitution, modern day slavery for teenagers. Um, and if you, we're just scraping the surface with uh, intervening and, and rescuing, there were 3,800 runaways in Iowa last year reported to law enforcement. We have a huge problem with homeless youth on the streets in Iowa. In fact, we are, in terms of the percent of homeless that are uh, underage, Iowa has the highest percent for their homeless population of any state in the country. So the youth uh, of AMP, and uh, it's achieving maximum potential. This is a, a, a youth group, statewide youth group, that uh, advocates for legislation. Right now, they're working on legislation at the Iowa, <coughs> at the Iowa legislature addressing human trafficking. Uh, we invite you to get online, see uh, the bill, and help, help these youth pass this bill. So on behalf of the youth of AMP, achieving maximum potential, and Youth and Shelter Services, it's my pleasure to present this outstanding contribution to the welfare of children and youth presented by the youth of AMP from across the state of Iowa. Uh, and by the way, there are over 4,000 kids in out-of-home placement right here in Iowa, and mostly foster homes. And we present this with our gratitude and heartfelt thanks to the Ambassador C. DeBaca. Well, thank you um, to everyone who's gotten up and said good things about me uh, so far. Um, this is the part where I'd like to just stop and <laughs> we'll just leave, leave it at that um, because um, I think that there's little that I can say that, that is going to stand up to it. Um, I would like to thank the Iowa Network Against Human Trafficking, um, the lectures program here at Iowa State, uh, Pat Miller, um, who um, when I was involved with the lectures program and when my sister uh, Susanna was involved, uh, especially through the Women's Center, uh, bringing folks in. Uh, Pat was never shy about uh, putting us to work when we needed to be, and I will always heed the call um, for Pat Miller. Um, I think that the, what I got as a student sitting in those chairs or as uh, someone helping out with the lectures um, was so much more than I'll ever be able to give back, and I think that the lectures program here at Iowa State um, is, um, and I'm very aware of, of this working in the Obama administration in the tough budget times that we find ourselves in. Um, it is a very good use of taxpayer money. And I think that all of us, that one infinitesimal part of our income taxes that actually go uh, all the way here to Iowa State and into the, the lectures program, if only everything was as well spent. Um, what I will guarantee you is that we are trying very hard to make sure um, that that little infinitesimal part of your tax dollars that comes to the State Department's anti-trafficking office um, is well spent. And I can't think of 
a better cause, frankly. As President Lincoln so eloquently said, if slavery is not wrong, then nothing is wrong. If government should not do anything, it should certainly fight slavery. And I think that this is one of the things that, for me, as I think about the work that George Belitzos and the folks over at YSS, um, the uh, pioneering uh, work that we walk in the, the footsteps of those who put together the precursor movement to the modern anti-slavery movement. I'll talk a little bit about the abolitionist movement, but the precursor movement that I'm mentioning is actually the domestic violence movement, the sexual violence movement. Um, my mentor, Mary Richards, who I always call out, uh, whether it's in uh, my video remarks or whether I'm here uh, personally, uh, who taught me that you can actually be compassionate and a prosecutor at the same time. Um, in fact, that you have to be, that it is a responsibility that you take into the courtroom with you. But that comes directly from the gains of the women's movement, the gains of the domestic violence and sexual violence movement. And a lot of what we're trying to do, a lot of what I'll talk about tonight, is that notion of how do we take these ideas that we learned about in the 70s and the 80s, ideas of powerlessness, ideas of identification with one's captor, ideas, whether we call it Stockholm Syndrome, battered women's syndrome, what have you, how do we take those and then not just put it into the fight against the human traffickers, but how do we make it part of American foreign policy? There is probably nothing that is more establishment, other than maybe banking, than American foreign policy. And how do you take something that was, a generation ago, a radical feminist notion of relations of power, dependency, et cetera? How do you take those notions and then actually weave it into the work that we do in the State Department and the embassies around the world, and more importantly, how do you go into regimes that are not necessarily known for having the most cutting edge approach on human rights issues, on gender issues, et cetera, and get them to start adopting it. That's only a little bit, of, bit about what I'm gonna talk about because I'm feeling very reflective. Coming home, I think, makes one feel reflective. Um, for me, it all comes back to Iowa, and I think that for so many alumni of Iowa State University, um, that is very much the case. Um, as an ambassador, um, I spend a lot of time on planes and visiting the far reaches of the globe. Um, I think that with the, the passing, um, after a, an amazing life of Chuck Manat, um, there are two of us now, um, Dan Mazina, uh, who graduated in the early 70s, who's our uh, ambassador to Bangladesh, and myself, as far as the Iowa State, um, I know there's the Iowa State ambassadors, the, when you're working with the Alumni Association, and then there's being an Iowa State alum who is an ambassador. Um, and I talked to Dan Mazina about this the other day before um, I came. Uh, I called him in, in Dhaka, and, and we both thought, talked a little bit about, for him, the journey from the dairy farm up by Dubuque, and for me, uh, the journey from the beef cattle farm in Southern Story County, um, and what we take out into the world. And so much of what we take out of the, into the world are the things that we experienced at Iowa State. The things that we experienced at home here in Iowa, a, a, a place in the country that seems rural, a place in the country that seems traditional, and yet a place in the country that is so much more in the world, engaged with the world, thinking about global affairs than many states in the country. And I think that that fuels us when we go out there. Now, I do spend a lot of time flying around and, and visiting foreign countries and visiting various, uh, whether it's dignitaries or people who are, are working on the front lines from the non-governmental organizations. Um, but there is definitely one place that I visit um, that it is not the embassy staff that um, tells me what the schedule is. Um, it's, uh, but instead, it's Mary DeBaca. Uh, and that is um, when I come back here. And I think that, like so many here at Iowa State, not just in the College of Agriculture, which needs her so much evidently that they've asked her to unretire and come back uh, for the summer. Um, but uh, I think many of us, whether it's in Story County 4-H or, or otherwise, uh, know that if Mary DeBaca thinks that it's important enough to be on the schedule, then it's going to be a priority. Um, so I want to um, think a little bit about what that means. You know, my father, who many of you knew, um, Robert C. DeBaca, who's in the animal science faculty, um, as well as, as my mother, um, did research on this campus uh, and in the name of Iowa State um, in Latin America and other places, work that made a difference, made an impact on farmers and ranchers 
men and women living in villages around the world that you're never going to know the names of. And their counterparts and their friends and their, and their colleagues did those same types of research, that same type of applied science. Academic work that translated to concrete results. And I think that, after all, that's Iowa State's rich legacy, that legacy of science with practice. And I've been thinking a lot about legacies um, in this reflective mood that I find myself in. A lot, of, a lot about the fight that I now uh, lead on behalf of President Obama against human trafficking, um, but also the historical and the moral imperative, the legacy that we have to carry out when we're thinking about this idea of what to many people, because of the new attention, because of the increased attention, it might seem like a new fight, might seem like a new call to action. But in fact, as with so many things, it comes back to the legacy. <clears throat> and I think that that legacy in Iowa comes back to the university. Part of that is because <clears throat> of this university's historical roots. While this country was raging in the throes of a, a civil war, a civil war which tens of thousands of people from Iowa who had never owned a slave, many who had never seen a slave, had marched off to in the summer of 1861 to fight for union, to fight for freedom. President Lincoln recognized that when the guns and the cannon fell silent, the Union would have to move forward and to rebuild itself. And that's why he made sure that even as garrisons of Union soldiers safeguarded Washington, D.C., that the country kept going about its business and planning for the future as well as it could. Now, the enduring symbol of that commitment is one of our greatest landmarks, the Capitol Dome, made of iron at the time that everything made of iron took a gun or a cannon out of the front lines. Through that cast iron that lifts the dome skyward was a critical commodity. Not just critical, lives depended on it. And yet, President Lincoln insisted that the work go on to show that the United States would persevere. If there's a concrete example of that commitment that lives on, other than the dome on the Capitol, it's the Morrill Act creating the land-grant university system. And in September of 1862, two very important things happened. At the beginning of September, Iowa was the first state to adopt its provisions. And that we are here at all today is proof of its legacy. Lincoln signed the Morrill Act at the same time that he was contemplating emancipation and what it would take to hold the union together. A generation later, earlier, in 1820, in a letter to a friend, Thomas Jefferson, writing about slavery, something that he knew tainted his own legacy, tainted his own morality as he continued to own slaves. Jefferson wrote to a friend and he said of slavery, I fear that we have a wolf by the ears, and we dare not let him go. In one hand, justice. In the other, self-preservation. Abraham Lincoln was having to make a decision. At the same time that he was promulgating the Morrill Act and creating a system of land-grant universities for the country that he thought he would be able to keep together. And that was that it wasn't a binary choice. It wasn't either or. Indeed, by choosing freedom was the only way to achieve self-preservation. The choices that he made were not anchored just in that moment in history. They were thinking about the future. And Iowa State carries on the legacy of the Morrill Act today. But what about his other more famous promise? Last month, we marked National Freedom Day, February 1st, commemorating the date the President Lincoln signed the 13th Amendment and sent it to the states for ratification. Freedom Day. Started under 
President Truman, at the request of aged persons who had been born into slavery. It grew into Black History Month and in many ways has been subsumed by Black History Month. In fact, the Freedom Day movement itself was founded by Major Richard Wright. He was born into slavery, but by the end of his life, he was a successful businessman. He was a survivor whose voice, like Brittany's tonight, could not be still. Later this year, we'll reach the 150th anniversary, not only of Iowa acceding to the Morrill Act and bringing Iowa State into the land grant system, but also the 150th anniversary of the issuance of the Emancipation Proclamation that begun the process of freedom. That proclamation that let so many voices lift, so many voices sing. But as we sit here 150 years after emancipation, there are estimated to be 27 million men, women, and children living around the world in slavery today. 27 million. There are some who say that though a smaller percentage of the world's population has a raw number, more people enslaved than any time in history. What about their voices? Who's listening to them? Who's hearing them? Who's responding to them? Just as in the 1800s, in many places, when you bring up the issue of modern slavery, human trafficking, some people want to turn away, to act as though it's not happening, to come up with another word, something that makes you feel more comfortable. Frederick Douglass once ridiculed the euphemisms that polite antebellum society used to actually avoid saying the word slavery, even as they practiced it legally. They called people servants. They called them their staff. They would twist themselves into pretzels with terms like the peculiar institution. Frederick Douglass might be surprised by how little we've made as far as progress is concerned in that regard. The polite term that we now use to shield ourselves is not servant or peculiar institution. It's trafficking in persons. It evokes movement. But at its core, it's trying to describe a crime of exploitation. Now, the official US government definition, the official position, broadly put, is to the trafficking in persons is all of the conduct that's involved in reducing someone to or holding them in a state of compelled service, whether it's for labor or sex, men or women, adults or children. It takes many forms. It occurs everywhere. And though the policy attention to this thing, trafficking in persons, is relatively new, at the end of the day, this phenomenon really is nothing more than the newest manifestation of an ancient crime. The newest thing that violates the promise of emancipation. Secretary of State Hillary Clinton perhaps said it best last year when you're talking to the cabinet, which she said, let's just call it what it is. It's modern slavery. She was listening. A little more than 10 years ago, led by then First Lady Hillary Clinton, the international community came together to address this problem. And here in the United States, at the federal level, we updated our anti-slavery laws from the late 1860s. And now, on almost 150 countries around the world are parties to the United Nations Protocol to prevent, suppress, and punish trafficking in persons. It's what we call the Palermo Protocol. And it established this 3P paradigm that says that you fight modern slavery through prevention, protection, and prosecution. It's what USAID Administrator Rod Shaw and I have described in public as development with teeth. The notion that prevention efforts are not alone are not enough if no one is brought to justice. The protecting the victims is not enough if the development work isn't done to give people options other than to go with the person who makes the promise of a better life. And the prosecution is not enough unless the systemic changes and the focus on the victims comes together. Or as I, 
growing up in Iowa, I like to call it a three-legged muffin stool. <laughs> that will fall over if all the legs aren't there. <coughs> in the United States, at that same time period, President Clinton issued what I think was the first executive order on the issue since the Emancipation Proclamation, and he signed into law the Trafficking Victims Protection Act. As I said, it updated the anti-slavery laws for the modern era, and it established my office, the Office to Monitor and Combat Trafficking Persons at the State Department. President Clinton was listening. Now, my office is responsible for diplomacy and foreign policy around the world. We look at what countries are doing to fight human trafficking. We look at what they need to be able to do better in the fight. And we assess those governments, and we, in fact, rank those governments on how they're doing. And even countries that get a high grade, tier one on our report, and the United States is one of those countries, is not doing very well. A tier one on the report to me is kind of like getting a C. It means you can play football on Friday night. But the idea of it being an A grade, we have a long way to go. But it's part of our foreign policy. Even just today, Vice President Biden was raising this with the Honduran president. And I was getting emails driving around campus trying to, OK, I'm about to admit texting and driving. No, no I'm not. Um, I will not admit texting and driving. I was getting emails in the Starbucks over at, at uh, the IV over on Lincoln Way um, from Air Force Two, getting his talking points together for when he goes in to talk to the Honduran president. Just last month, President Obama, in declaring January to be Human Trafficking and Slavery Awareness Days, challenged all of us to commemorate but also to rededicate ourselves in the fight against modern slavery. They're listening. But as we try to talk to foreign governments, and as we try to talk to the foreign policy establishment, and as we try to talk to legislators and governors and business people and community leaders around the country, we seem to often have to explain why we're doing this. Why does the United States government care if a child in a West African country is enslaved on a cocoa plantation? Why does the United States government care if someone is in a brothel in Bombay, unable to leave? Why does the United States government care if men are on a fishing boat southeast of New Zealand being beaten and raped and tortured merely for asking for some food. Now, as an ambassador, I have these conversations trying to explain that. And the conversations are often geared towards the governments, those that, people who are concerned with law or development or other policy concern. And we talk about how our rationale for fighting trafficking fits in with those concerns. It undermines the rule of law. It threatens our security. It devastates communities. It hurts families. It undercuts development priorities. All of these are very sound, very good reasons for pressing forward in the fight against human trafficking. But the way that I usually end those conversations is to say that as important as all of those policy reasons might be, Part of it is that fighting slavery is simply who we are as a nation. It's part of delivering on the promise of freedom. It's part of building on the legacy that men from here in Story County marched off to war to defend 150 years ago. Now, why is this the case? In many ways, it's because of the two documents that I mentioned earlier, the Emancipation Proclamation and the 13th Amendment. They didn't just reflect the ultimate goal of the abolitionist movement. They're not merely words in our law and history books. As Dr. King said at the March in Washington, in many ways, the 13th Amendment is a blank check, never cashed. Those documents certainly did not mark a moment in our history when slavery all of a sudden just up and ended. But they were promises. 
They were promised that neither slavery nor involuntary servitude shall exist, a promise that was written in the blood of all those who had lived and died in legal slavery from the first Angolan taken off that ship at Jamestown in 1619. A promise written in, all the, in the blood of all who answered the battle hymns challenge to die to make them free. President Lincoln didn't just say that slavery was the ultimate wrong. He bound us with that sacred promise that neither slavery nor involuntary servitude should exist. Not then, not now, not ever. But I think as I explain why we do this in that way, I can feel something changing. It feels like something's changing in the way that we look at this moment. Maybe people are beginning to make the historical connection with themselves. Maybe it's the work of the last 15 years by folks at the grassroots level, like people in the Iowa Network Against Human Trafficking, like people in the prosecutor's offices. Maybe the cruel reality of this modern crime is a little bit more clear than it was a few years ago. Now, it could be that I'm thinking so much about this legacy and the need to deliver on the promise of freedom. Because in the last month, I've delivered speeches in President Lincoln's cottage, three miles north of the White House, just high enough on the hill and just far enough from the swamp that you could live there during the summer and not get malaria back in 1862. And I was able to give a speech about what we're trying to do around the world in the very room in which he wrote the Emancipation Proclamation. It could be three weeks ago, but not only did I get to, to visit the Frederick Douglass House in Washington, DC, but to hear children as young as seven who had memorized some of his greatest speeches, dressed up in their little Frederick Douglass outfits, much more eloquent than I could ever be. Second graders, talking the words of freedom. You see, whether it's at the National Trust for Historic Preservation, which runs President Lincoln's Cottage, or the Park Service, or museums like the National Underground Railroad Museum in Cincinnati, it seems that the people who are entrusted with preserving and protecting the legacy of our country's original sin are already ahead of me in reaching that this conclusion that I've been trying inartfully to make in the, the last month, which is that slavery and our promise to end it is not a thing of the past. Emancipation was a promise for all time, and those who care about civil rights bear a responsibility to continue that fight. <coughs> so now that I've drawn that line from past to present, how does the slavery of 150 years ago inform our struggle today. Well, first of all, though it did not end exploitation in the United States by any means, talk to all of the folks who lived under sharecropping in the ensuing decades. When the 13th Amendment became the law of the land, it became the government's fight. Slavery was no longer legal. Today, it's a crime, and we have an obligation to respond to it accordingly. And while the values that underlay the abolition of slavery and the promise of freedom haven't changed, slavery itself has, and so has the way that we've responded to it. Over the last 150 years, enforcing the 13th Amendment has required new laws that adapt to the way that slavery has evolved, new laws that take into account the gains of the domestic violence movement, the understanding of the psychology of victimization. But in the first half of the 20th century, Involuntary servitude and slavery continued across America, and especially in the American South, as what we would call peonage, debt bondage, sharecropping. A few administrations, notably under Presidents Grant, both Roosevelt's and Carter, made some progress curbing the crime, but efforts had always dropped off when power changed in Washington. The voices were still calling for justice, but the halls of power just weren't listening. 
the longest sustained effort that we've seen on this fight has taken place in the last 15 years. Three administrations, both major parties. And when President Obama declared January to be Trafficking Prevention and Awareness Month, he was continuing and intensifying the commitment shown by George Bush and Bill Clinton. Now, I think that one of the things that we've seen is the building up of structures, the building up of laws, the building up of conventions. All of these are important. But laws and policies and even college courses and the Trafficking in Persons Report that my office puts out every year, all of these things help us understand the challenges and the changing nature of slavery. And all of these allow us to continue to fight against slavery. But these things themselves are not slavery. These things themselves are not trafficking. Slavery today is what slavery's always been about. It's about people. People who are trapped under the power and cruelty, not just under an economic system or a culture, but under actual cruel masters. It's about a woman leaving her home and her family because she's been promised an opportunity for a good job, <clears throat> only to find herself locked in a basement as a domestic worker or a brothel in, a, in prostitution. It's about being made to work in a field without pay or a way to leave. It's about men on a farm or a fishing boat, crushing hours, no way to leave, constantly being told you'll be turned over to the police. They'll catch you if you try to run. Maybe even lies being made up. The last people that tried to run got caught. One of my friends prosecuted a case with two young men from Haiti. The average weight of these two, excuse me, not Haiti, Jamaica. The average weight of these two young men is about 280 pounds. They were working as lumberjacks up in New Hampshire. Big, strong, young men. And the woman that we put in jail for enslaving them was about five feet tall and weighed about 110 pounds soaking wet. But she had them convinced that if they tried to leave that farm, if they tried to leave that shed, the diameter, the size of which was, I think, maybe even smaller than this podium, than this platform. It's one of those little sheds that you can get at Home Depot. That the police would hunt them down and put them in jail. I'll never forget what my friend from the prosecutor's office told me when she came back from trial. She said these big, muscular men the second that they saw her in court, they couldn't take their eyes off her. It was palpable how much power she still had over them. And yet, this is not about powerlessness. This is not about victims being naive or stupid. This is not about anything other than people being trapped in a situation where there's an imbalance of power that they can't get out of. It's about people. It's about girls who should still be in high school or middle school. It's about children who should be learning to read and write instead of being forced into the worst kind of service imaginable. And like Frederick Douglass himself experienced when he was sent to Baltimore as a house servant, it's about the escalation of violence as the torture and the cruelty fails to satisfy the trafficker over time. What he described as the escalation of first the curse and then the hand and then the belt eerily mirrors what we hear from victims today. And that's why we continue this struggle. As much as our laws and our policies are rooted in the past, so too is the constant reminder that this is about people. Now, Douglas himself <clears throat> shed his bonds of slavery to become one of the great orators and statesmen, not just in the history of the United States, but of the world. <clears throat> he traveled the country railing against the evil that he endured. He 
He pushed President Lincoln to action. And his activism expanded beyond the issue of slavery. At the Seneca Falls Conference, when the giants of the women's movement hesitated, thinking that it might be smarter not to push for the vote. It was Frederick Douglass, the man at the women's conference, who stood up and said, if you're going to fight for me to vote, we need to make sure that you can vote too. It was Frederick Douglass, after the Civil War, who came out and said, these new immigrants, these Chinese, these Eastern Europeans, these Hispanics, we didn't just fight for our freedom so that they could be exploited in the same way. In his famous speech in 1867, the Composite Nation speech, he understood that this was something that we had to be constantly vigilant against, and it was something that we had to make sure it didn't happen to other people. Now, I mentioned Richard Wright earlier, the founder of the Freedom Day movement, born into slavery, graduated valedictorian of Atlanta University, eventually became the highest ranking African American in the United States Army, and the paymaster of the US Army during the Spanish War. He became president of Georgia State Industrial College for Colored Youth, which is now Savannah State University. And at age 67, he enrolled in the Wharton School, got his MBA, and opened the first black-owned bank in the North. It was thanks to his determination not only that we have National Freedom Day, but Black History Month. And these are the stories that we know or we should know. These stories are and should be as intrinsic to the fabric of American history as what President Lincoln said at Gettysburg. But there are other many stories that we don't know. So many stories. Stories like Brittany's that you heard tonight, but stories from the past as well. One story I didn't know until very recently is about a man who escaped slavery and then went on to fight it in a different way. His name was Spotswood Rice, and we know about him by a letter that's in the National Archives, a letter that he wrote from the battle lines to Catherine Dates, a white woman in Missouri, a woman who still thought she owned him. Spotswood Rice did not have Douglas's eloquence. He didn't have Harriet Tubman's knowledge of which doors to knock on on the way north to find a safe refuge during the day. What he did have was something much more frank. He had the terrible Swiss story. He had the Springfield rifle that he was given and a thousand other freedmen who marched with him back into Missouri. And he knew why he was going. Through the centuries, his voice literally shakes with emotion in the letter that he wrote to his erstwhile owner in September of 1864. He says, I want you to understand that Mary is my child, and she is a God-given right of my own. <clears throat> and you may hold on to her as long as you can, but I want you to remember this thing. The longer you keep my child from me, the longer you will have to burn in hell, and the quicker you will get there. <laughs> I want you now to just hold on to her if you want to. If your conscience tells you that that's the road, go that road and what it will bring to, with you. Katie Diggs, I have no fears about getting out Mary out of your hands. This whole government gives cheer to me, and you cannot help yourself. 73 years later, that little girl Mary was interviewed as part of the WA, WPA's Federal Writers Project. She had gone to school, married, had seven children, and lived into her 80s, living next door to her, her daughter and six grandchildren. Bent with age and gray, she told that historian in 1937, I love army men. My father, my brother, my husband and son were all army men. I love a man who will fight for his rights and any man that wants to be something. The whole country should give cheer to Spotswood Rice for his bravery and his determination in fighting for his rights and ours, and that his voice has been forgotten for so long is a shame. 
Another survivor's voice that's just recently been heard again is that of Jordan Anderson. Jordan Anderson was born into slavery in Big Spring, Tennessee. After emancipation, he was able to go to Dayton, Ohio. According to some documents that have emerged, at the end of the war, the man who had enslaved him, also named Anderson, wrote to Jordan Anderson and actually asked that he come back to Tennessee and go back to work on the farm where he'd been enslaved for 32 years. Jordan Anderson is said to have replied with the help of someone who could write, and the letter was given to an abolitionist newspaper, the Cincinnati Commercial. It appeared there and in the New York Tribune in August of 1865. Here's what was printed in the paper. I want to know particularly what the good chance is you propose to give to me. I'm doing tolerably well here. I get $25 a month, fixed victuals and clothing. A comfortable home for Mandy, the folks here call her Mrs. Anderson. And the children, Millie Jane and Grundy, go to school and are learning well. As to my freedom, you can say that I have. There's nothing to be gained on that score, as I got my papers in 1864 for the provost marshal of the Department of Nashville. Mandy says she'd be afraid to go back without some kind of proof that you were disposed to treat us justly and kindly. And we've concluded to test your sincerity by asking you to send us our wages for the time we served you. If you fail to pay us for faithful labors in the past, we can have little faith in your promises in the future. We trust the good maker has opened your eyes to the wrongs which you and your fathers have done to me and my fathers in making us toil for you for generations without recompense. Surely there will be a day of reckoning for those who defraud the laborer of his hire. Jordan Anderson ends his letter by saying, the great desire of my life now is to give my children an education and have them form virtuous habits. Now, whether we're talking about the famous or the should be famous, a Frederick Douglass, a Richard Wright, or a Spotswood Rice or Jordan Anderson, when we look at what each of them accomplished with their lives, the way they lived their lives, what we don't see, what you don't see when you meet a trafficking survivor now, is a helpless person who's been plucked out of enslavement by some kind of righteous rescuer. What you see is a survivor, a fighter, someone who had it, what it took to survive in that situation. Not somebody who needed somebody else to confer agency on them before they moved on to their lives as advocates and teachers and businessmen and mothers and fathers. They weren't waiting around for someone to free them so they could become those things. They didn't steal away in the middle of the night because some, someone told them it was okay to. Any more than a trafficking victim now goes through that open window or passes that note to a client because someone said, it's all right if you try to leave. The determination of a Spotswood Rice, the wit of a Jordan Anderson, these are not the voices of the helpless. These are the voices of strong people who have been kept in servitude by a social system, by a culture, and by, yes, cruel masters. They had help. Of course they did. Emancipation cleared a roadblock. But I think that whether or not the government gave Spotswood Rice cheer and a Springfield musket, or the provost marshal had given Jordan Anderson his papers, regardless of that, they knew that they were free. Freedom was a fact. Once free, they were neither incapable or pitiful. And we know this because once they were empowered, it was through their own will and determination that they lived out the lives that they wanted, whether as an orator, an advocate, educator, business person, whether important to the entire world or only their family or friends, it was their choice, the choice that they'd been denied. Mothers and fathers whose desire was to give their children an education, the education that they had been denied. These individual accounts of people like Jordan Anderson and Spots with Rice show us that history is not a monolith. It's a fabric woven of countless threads, each thread as unique as the experience that it represents. And so today, when we consider victims of modern slavery, we also need to consider that modern slavery is not just something that's happening in theory. It's not just happening to some statistics. It's happening to people, to individuals, 
whose families and talents and hopes and lives are as unique as those whose honor, whose honor voices we remember today in this 150th anniversary of emancipation. If there's a lesson to be learned from the lives of those who survive and move on with their lives, it's that our goal should be today to provide survivors the opportunities to lead the lives they choose. Not to blunder in willy-nilly to rescue the powerless, but to walk with them on their journey to a better life, a journey to freedom. Because at the end of the day, the trafficking victim, the survivor of 2012, wants the same thing that the survivor of 1862 wanted. The things that the traffickers denied to them. In the modern era, many people become enslaved because they're trying for a better life for their families, a better opportunity. They're willing to chance it to get an education for their little sister, medical care for their grandparents, maybe a roof for their parents' little house, a way out from the abuse that they might be suffering at home, or a way to a better opportunity, a singer, a model, just someone who can be loved. Many people, when they think about human trafficking, if they think about human trafficking, think about the kidnapping shown in the movie Taken. They don't think about the man who uses love, the labor broker who uses opportunity, and the willingness in the beginning stages of the person who doesn't know that by saying yes, they're actually putting their foot in the trap. Now, survivors might need protection from pimps or their former bosses, but that doesn't mean throwing them in a shelter and forcing them to stay there. If they're immigrants, they might want to return home, or they may want to stay here in the United States and have the better life that they wanted. And so that means providing them legal recourse. They might want to face their accuser in court, or they might want to just walk away and leave their past behind. This means giving them the choice. It means letting their choices and their voices actually mean something. There's a young lady that I think about named Shamaya Hall. She's Egyptian. Well, until about a month and a half ago, she was Egyptian. For years, the America that she knew was the garage in California where she was kept by the family that had enslaved her starting at age nine. When she was liberated from that family at the age of 13, they went to jail. She's going to college. She wants to be a federal agent so that she can be for others what she saw in that moment when the police came through the door and got her out. And about a month and a half ago, she stood in a courtroom in Southern California, and she became an American citizen. She had the opportunity. She's living the life that she had sought for herself. She's living the life that she had been denied when those people told her and her parents, send her to America with us, and she'll get an education. Like Frederick Douglass and the others, like Brittany tonight, her voice cannot be stilled. So when we talk about laws and structures and things that my office does and diplomacy and presidents and prime ministers and all of these important things, we have to ask, actually, how does the responsibility of all of these players, all of these governments, how does that square? How does that balance with the aim of empowering survivors? And the answer to that question, I think, depends on how far government has come in addressing human trafficking in this modern way. Now, I've said earlier, no government is perfect. That gentleman's C should not be enough. But some are doing more. Some are doing a lot more than others. The ones that are doing the most are the ones who follow this 3P paradigm that I mentioned. Prevention, protection, prosecution. It's what we call the victim-centered approach. And I think that part of the reason why we see the victim-centered approach succeed 
is because it reflects this notion that at the end of the day, this is a crime about people. It's a crime about a person, a person whose civil rights, whose human rights have been violated. And they have to be central to the case. Governments can do what they can do. Civil society can do what we can do. But it has to be done in a way that levels the playing field. Job training, education, treatment, counseling, putting more opportunities within reach. But at the end of the day, the reality is that many of the men and women who are freed from modern slavery are freed because they found themselves with the courage to finally walk away, to go to the police, to tell someone. Their courage might get them 90% of the, of the way. We've got to get them the rest of the way across the finish line. And although government is primarily responsible for doing this, government can't do it alone. As you've heard, I come from a law enforcement background. I was a federal prosecutor doing these cases in the early days of the modern movement. So I know how effective and how important <coughs> prosecutions are. But we are not going to prosecute our way out of this crime. And I don't think that we've necessarily yet found the solution that allows us to fully deliver on the promise of freedom. <clears throat> there are about four to 6,000 trafficking prosecutions globally every, every year, and they take an enormous amount of attention, of time, of sophistication. And there are as many as 27 million victims. Now, I went to law school because I didn't want to do math. But even I know that 6,000 divided into 27 million is not doing very well. Whatever it is that's going to eradicate this crime once and for all, we haven't necessarily found it yet. And perhaps that should be our call to action. Not as rescuers or crusaders or white knights charging up the hill, but certainly not sitting back and hoping that the police and the prosecutors will do everything. Instead, we need to approach this as innovators and teachers who help devise new techniques and new strategies to empower survivors and get them across the finish line. Activists who insist that the fight against trafficking be funded at the level that it deserves. The future of this movement is in our classrooms, in our boardrooms, in our church basements and community centers, and more and more people understanding how this crime intersects our lives, the way that it's tied to our history, and the way that each and every one of us can do something. And that brings us back here to Iowa, to Iowa State, to the Morrill Act, Lincoln didn't just want to build colleges and universities. He wanted to build colleges and universities that led to practical, measurable benefits for the country that he was fighting to defend. Agriculture, science, engineering. Recall this was a time when almost 80% of Americans lived on farms and worked in agriculture. The practical applications that Americans needed were clearly defined by the ways that Americans lived. And so Iowa State's history not only realized the vision of the Morrill Act, but in many ways, in perhaps one of the best things that we ever did at Iowa State, played a role in delivering on Lincoln's other great promise of freedom. Not just freeing people from bondage, but providing opportunity and knowledge to those who survived. And boy, did we ever deliver. One of those people was one of those survivors. One of those people was the first African-American student at this university. One of those people was George Washington Carver. Dr. Carver's parents were bought for $700 as a couple. He was the only one of their 12, 12 children to survive to adulthood. And as we know, he was the first African-American to study here at Iowa State. Later, the first black faculty member he took his knowledge home to Alabama, and he took the science with practice ethos of Iowa State with him to Tuskegee. He revolutionized botany and agriculture, and he helped countless people in like Frederick Douglass's house and Lincoln's cottage, his birthplace, the humble cabin in which he was born, is a national monument today, rising to the challenge of freedom, not allowing your voice to be stilled. 
So what are the practical applications that we need today to meet the same challenge that Lincoln identified? Jobs, innovation, energy, technology, solutions for sustainable agriculture in a globalized economy, new ways to reduce crime, promote development, alleviate poverty, integrate vulnerable populations into society. Now those actually sound like the practical applications that we need for a better world. They're also the practical applications that we need to fight modern slavery. And you don't need to work in the anti-trafficking movement to be a modern day abolitionist, although we are trying very hard to make sure that there are jobs in the anti-trafficking movement for all who would want to do this as a career. But in the meantime, everybody can help to solve the problem. We can do it by looking at the ways that our lives touch modern slavery, the way the goods that we consume might be touched by forced labor, the way that we're too accepting of a culture that per permits the exploitation of prostitution. We can do it by making sure that people understand this lingering challenge in our daily lives and in our communities. We can do it by logging on to one of the things I'm most proud of as my, in my tenure as the head of the Office to Monitor and Combat Trafficking in Persons. As I said earlier, we're trying very hard in this tight budget time to make your taxpayers' dollars go very far. And in doing that, we provided the seed money for a website called slaveryfootprint.org, which allows you to take a 15 to 20 minute survey about what you own, what you eat, how many gadgets you have, how you live your life, and it'll tell you much like the carbon footprint calculators will about your environmental impact, it'll tell you what kind of impact you're having on slavery. Answering a very simple question, how many slaves of those 27 million work for me? I fight slavery for a living. And I have 84 people around the world who are working in bondage to sustain the lifestyle that I live. Doesn't mean that I should go be a hermit. I wouldn't be a very good hermit. I like to talk too much. <laughs> I guess you can still talk if you're a hermit. There's just nobody that talks back. But I think that the, the thing that we have to realize is that it has to be a call to action for what we can do. Every one of us by living in this modern society, has a slavery footprint. And we have to know ours. We can do it by taking the survey on slaveryfootprint.org. We can hopefully offset it by taking action with things like the Iowa Coalition. But at the end of the day, what it does, I think, is it challenges us as a consumer, as someone who lives in the modern era, it challenges us not to just hear the voices of the past, but those around us who yearn to be free. Those voices, if we only listen, if we only hear them, demand that we take notice. The promises that were made in September of 1862 demand that we continue to act, that we continue to be a voice for those who can't lift their own and that we walk with them on their road to freedom and recovery. If we do that, we can achieve the world that was dreamed of, that was fought for, and that was died for, a world without slavery. Thank you very much.